Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to North York General Hospital's Emergency Medicine Update. Uh, my name is Rick Pensner from North York General Hospital Emergency Services Program, and I am thrilled to be moderating our very first webinar. So this is our 33rd annual Emergency Medicine Update, what has become Canada's largest annual emergency medicine event. And for 32 years, we've been doing this in person in downtown Toronto. We've been asking all of you to travel from across the country to join us. Uh, I've been involved in this conference dating back about 28 years. And so, you know what? We decided this year we're going to do things a little bit differently. We're ready for a little bit of change. So for the next four weeks, we will be moderating live webinars presented to you by our Emergency Medicine Update stars from the main stage. We'll be bringing this to you weekly and we'll be bringing this to you for free, although I actually think it's going to be kind of priceless. Now, our conference and our webinars this year uh, are not going to be about COVID. There's actually some pretty great educational materials online out there. There's been a lot of leadership by the emergency medicine community in this, in this area. But we actually think it's going to be important to bring all of us together to share as a community, to continue to learn and to support each other. You know, we are still seeing patients in the emergency department that still need to be cared for, and we need to move on, and we need to continue with what we think is going to be the new, new normal. But I do want to take a minute, and I actually want to thank uh, each and every one of you for everything that you've been doing over the last two, three months, because it's been pretty incredible. Uh, these pictures and dozens and dozens of these pictures are actually inside our COVID assessment center, uh, inside our hospital as I walk in. They, they literally inspire me every single day as I start my shift. And, you know, these last couple of months have been, uh, have been a real challenge for all of us. And I, and I know it's been really a, a powerful experience, but I have to say that I'm really quite proud that I've had the opportunity to be part of it. So a few housekeeping matters to take care of. If you do tweet, we encourage you to tweet out comments ideas during the session uh, at hashtag EMU2020, or you can follow us at EM underscore update. We hope that you will take a couple of minutes after the session and evaluate our, our session. You know, we're new to this. Dave wants some feedback. I want some feedback. We want to figure out how to do this better. So as you leave the webinar, you'll be prompted to fill out a very brief evaluation form. Please take a minute or two to do that. We really are going to appreciate the feedback. And just a little tip, uh, you actually need to click leave webinar, that little red button, to take you to the evaluation form instead of just closing your browser. For Q&A, we, uh, we're going to take questions at the end. Dave's going to be presenting at the beginning. There will be opportunity for you to submit questions by just clicking on the little Q&A button at the bottom of your, of your browser. Feel free to submit questions throughout the entire session, even though we're not going to be taking them at the end. I'm going to be moderating the Q&A. Uh, there's lots and lots of people signed on. Right now, we've got 164. We're expecting upwards to 500 people. And so we expect there's going to be lots of questions. I will do my best to, to moderate and get to as many questions as possible, but, uh, but I'm going to apologize in advance. There's probably going to be uh, some questions that I'm not going to be able to get to. So our emergency medicine update star today is Dr. David Carr. Dr. Carr is an associate professor in the Division of Emergency Medicine at the University of Toronto. He is an emergency physician and a clinical investigator at the University Health Network and McKenzie Health Hospital. He's been the recipient of multiple undergraduate and postgraduate clinical teaching awards. During baseball season, he works at the Rogers Centre as the medical director of stadium medicine for the Toronto Blue Jays. So I guess David has quite a bit of time on his hands now, unfortunately. Uh, welcome, David. Oh, How thanks doing? for having me. I'm good. I'm pretty good. So um, we've shared a few drinks uh, over, over the years. I have to say, I've never actually had you over to my house for cocktails. So welcome to my home and, and cheers. Cheers. Um, you know, it's not, um, 
it's not lost on me that emergency medicine update has actually asked two of the most technologically challenged individuals to lead our first webinar. I think we're gonna have some fun tonight. And I also know that the uh, par participants in the audience are gonna be a little bit tolerant if we screw things up a little bit. So I'm, I'm not too worried about that. Uh, so during these last few months, David, how, how have you been doing? How's it going? Yeah, I think it's okay. I think we're uh, certainly at this point in the game getting used to being a bit more comfortable in our skin. Uh, certainly a lot more tense, anxious moments up front, but now I think we're in the groove. I think uh, in Canada to our foreign listeners, uh, in Toronto, we've, we've done well, comparably to some of our, uh, our colleagues in the States, mainly in New York and New Jersey. Um, so I think we braced for the worst and we were prepared and look, our volumes have been down and we've been coping. It's not as much fun as it used to be, but we've been coping. And Thank and you. remind me because I forget. Were you were you around during SARS? Were you a resident I was during SARS? Final year of my residency. Yeah, I was my final year there residency. Okay. I think okay. you have different thoughts as a resident as a staff. Uh, mainly, you're younger and more invincible, and uh, I don't feel younger and invincible anymore, though kind of. But uh, different thoughts. You got families. You got kids. You got partners. You know, so lots of uh, different dynamics. I feel as a mature emergency physician. So, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of months, as, I, as I'm sure you have, kind of reflecting on this experience, both professionally and personally. And so I actually want to ask you, what would you say has been probably uh, the biggest impact or the biggest learning from a professional perspective? And I, and I know you're kind of a wishy-washy kind of guy, but I want you to actually just pick one, be dogmatic and pick one. Can you, can you share with all of us what that might be? Oh, you're putting me on the spot, Richard. Uh, look, I don't know. It's been amazing to see people rally. It's been amazing to see the community rally. It's been amazing to see my colleagues rally, the nurses, the physicians, my advanced practice providers. I don't think I've ever felt more in touch and in line with my colleagues. Uh, I think it's cheesy to say you're going to war, going to battle, but this will be the closest it is for emergency physicians to really feel that alignment. And, and so that would be professional. What, what about uh, personally? What's been the sort of biggest personal impact over the last couple of months for David Carr? Yeah, I think it's uh, personally as making adjustments as a father, as a husband, as a physician, uh, trying to adapt. Change is not something that I'm super great at. Um, I miss the conference scene. This is uh, the phone world is something I love. I, I hate seeing conferences canceled. I hate not being in front of a stage. Uh, and I hate that my kids are robbed of some of the things they love to do the most. So firstly, it's challenges, but we're going to get there. I have no doubt. It's just a matter of time. Excellent. And, and, and it's, it's been on my mind. I know it's on the committee's mind. I wonder if the participants uh, are all wondering about this now. Um, are you wearing shoes right now? No, no, but I won't, I won't go below the waist. I mean, I picked the shirt and that's all that really matters. Okay, there you go. Okay. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm going to let you take control of the screen. Uh, I'll give you a couple of minutes to sort of get your slides up. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to let uh, everybody else know that, as I said, for the next four weeks, we're going to be running webinars on a weekly basis. Uh, next Wednesday, May 27th, we have Justin Morgenstern presenting on seizures. The following Wednesday on June 3rd, we have Anthony Crocco presenting on child abuse. And the following Wednesday after that, on June 10th, we have Sarah Gray talking about optimizing performance. And uh, stay tuned, you'll get emails about that. So uh, David, over to over. Okay, well, it's an honor to be here. It's a different experience. And uh, this is a labor of love. This is uh, a talk that means something to me. Uh, STEMI-ish, not everything that you think is a STEMI is a STEMI. I gotta make a shout out to my good friend and colleague, Jesse McLaren, who was great to supply some ECGs and his EM cases is a wonderful clinical tool. Check it out. You know, two days ago I was at work, someone sprained an ankle. I was pretty happy because they passed their COVID screen. They sprained their ankle. I looked at the x-ray. The x-ray was normal. 
I went to see them, I sent them home, and then I realized I really miss this guy. I really miss Aaron. I really miss that in the past year I've lost just about all the knowledge he's taught me about orthopedics. And uh, I'm starving for that uh, uptake and reuptake of that knowledge. And Aaron, I promise next year, uh, next patient I see, I will examine that person before looking at the x-ray and double check. Um, and I really miss that stage. This is my happy place. Uh, this is, in my opinion, Canada's premier conference. And uh, what I would say is if you do indulge, and I've always wanted to do this, please join me for a toast and raise your glass to Inu 2021, to the most amazing conference that will ever be. And cheers, l'chaim, whatever you toast to, prost, sante. Okay, let's get to serious stuff. Let's get to serious stuff. And what I wanna tell you is there are three times in this talk that I'm gonna ask you to speak out loud. And one of the amazing things about the technology these days is the folks at EMU have come up with this way that even if you're unmuted, I can hear you talking. I can hear you. So I'm gonna only ask you three times to participate. You're muted, but I can hear you. And all I want you to do right now is I want you to look at this ECG. You were handed this cardiogram by the nurse, and he or she sends you this ECG, and I want you to look at this. And in the count of three, I want you, I want you to shout out how you would manage this patient, okay? One, two, three. Ah, okay. So it seems like you are managing this patient incorrectly. And the reason is we don't manage EKGs we manage patients okay and that's a very important thing a very important thing we manage patients not cardiograms so what are we going to do today we're going to talk about three things and there's three things and three parts of a cardiac exam a cardiac patient the first one is the simplest one in terms of interpretation and that's a troponin test that's a serum biomarker and i can look at that and i can tell you if it's abnormal The second one is the EKG. And you know what? You come to email, you've been around, you can see that this is abnormal, and the EKG is kind of gravy. You can look at it, you'll get that answer. But the real art, the real skill, the real master clinician asks, how does it feel? And I have a couple conflicts of interest. My conflicts of interest are such. My POCA skills, they're average. I got Eddie 1, Eddie 2, they're pretty average. I routinely lie about the JVP, and I can never actually look in someone's eyes to see the fundus. And lastly, when it comes to COVID, I barely even examine patients anymore. But what I can do, and what I challenge you to do, and what I challenge you to learn, is to learn to take a history well. And that's what we're gonna focus on today. Because what we wanna do is we wanna find out what a STEMI looks like and walks like. If it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. But not all STEMIs are ducks. And that's what STEMI-ish is. So I have something that I want to get off my chest. I want to get off my chest before we even start. If you Google search the word Levine sign, if you Google search the word Levine sign, you will not see a woman. You will see a man, probably less fit than this gent, who's overweight, who's crushing, who's in agony, who looks terrible. If you do look Levine sign in a woman and you sort out a bunch of stuff, including uh, the lead singer of Maroon 5, you will find some woman in what looks like a yoga pose, in a butterfly position over her heart, and she looks just very peaceful. This is ridiculous. It is time that we learn about women and chest pain. In 2018, there was a study called the Virgo study, which is the variation in recovery and role in gender and outcome. 
it looked at 2,000 men, or sorry, 2,000 women and 1,000 men admitted to 103 U.S. hospitals who were on the younger side in my cohort. And they looked at them and what they found is that men and women, when they had STEMIs and acute MIs, they had chest pain. And that was kind of it, and that's common. But there are some differences. And the difference is, is when you look at women, women report more symptoms. They were more likely to report greater than three associated symptoms, such as palpitation or epigastric pain or burping. Women are more likely to think themselves that they're suffering from anxiety almost twice as often as men. And not surprisingly, the men who think they're so tough are assuming that their chest pain is more likely to be musculoskeletal. Maybe they were in the gym doing weights, but their perceptions cloud it for the practitioners. Women are a lot more likely to have had care for a similar complaint in the past week. And in that time, the doctor felt that their description of this MI pain was non-cardiac more than half the time. What does this lead to? It leads to a fact that if you take men and women the same age, women have a higher risk of dying of an acute MI. What we need to do is break and women are typical. Enough of this women are a typical bullshit. Men and women say the same things, they say it differently. And it behooves the clinician to take a better history. We need to start recognizing these differences and go at it and take a better control and a better job at looking after our female patients with chest pain. Okay, that's off my chest. I'm living it. I'm loving it. You think McDonald's actually, if they, whoever their marketing person must have got fired to have an ad with a run of some heart block and then a little run of non-sustained VTAC. Clearly that's not making we want to eat Big Mac and a 20 pack of nuggets. Not that great. Okay, I'm loving it. Let's talk patience. Let's talk stories. 73 year old woman came to see me about five years ago. She got up, she felt fine. She was having some tea. And then all of a sudden, she became short of breath. She didn't have much pain, she just was breathless. She's booked for a Whipple's procedure at my hospital for a newly diagnosed pancreatic cancer in three days. So she came to see me at that hospital. She was tacky at 125. She was hypertensive at 177, over 94, and she was hypoxic at 68%. She was short of breath, hypoxic. My first thought was an x-ray. Well, there's no COVID there and she doesn't look too bad. She's not an overt pulmonary edema. What the hell's going on here? You get a cardiogram. I think it still has remnants of the circle that I had at that ST elevation in AVR. And this is the second time I'm gonna call on you. The second time I'm going to call on you and I'm going to ask you, what do you think of this ECG? Okay, remember, I can hear you even though you're unmuted. I'm going to count to three and you're going to scream out in your home with your drink in your hand or no drink what you think is the diagnosis. One, two, three. Fantastic. Very high majority got that. This woman has a pulmonary embolism. And when you look at patients, who present with a workup. Here's a study that looked at 6,000 patients being worked up for the diagnosis of a PE. 350 of them actually had a PE. And when you look at the characteristics with the strongest likelihood ratios, you can see that that S1Q3T3 that you get thrilled about is right up at top. You, you will start to see the importance of T wave inversions in those anterior precordial leads and then the tachycardia and right bundle band spot. You can see that this EKG will guide you. It's not only that shortness of breath, it's the guidance. What about if you look at cardiogenic shock or death? This was a study that combined 10 studies. It's a meta-analysis of 10 studies, over 3,000 patients said, which of the five key factors have the highest odds ratio for cardiogenic shock or death. Again, that T wave inversion creeps up again with seven times increased risk of major adverse cardiac events. 
your ST elevation, your tachy, and then your S1, Q3, T3 shows up there as well. You need to learn to respect the EKG. It is not about showing off the findings. It is prognostic because these findings tell you that that patient is at high risk for dying. What about this? You know, ST elevation and AVR, this used to be a big thing. I think several emus ago, we all got pretty jacked on this. And we all got pretty jacked on this about saying, you know, ST elevation and AVR, you might have a left main disease. Maybe you don't want to give an antiplatelet agent. Maybe we should call code STEMIs and all these people. I think we've backed off a little bit from that recommendation. If you think about it, if you look at ST elevation and AVR, a third of the time you see ACS, in which only about 10%, you'll actually find a culprit lesion. A third of them will have a tachyarrhythmia, like a left bundle or LVH that will mimic it, or a hypokalemia. And a third will be non-cardiac, like a PE or shock state. And the way I think of this is for those of us who used to call cath labs with new left bundles, if you see someone with SD elevation and AVR who's eating a bag of Cheetos and texting on his phone, he probably is not a cath lab activation. So recognize the importance of SD elevation and AVR, but realize that it's not always a slam dunk. Have that discussion. And sometimes PEs try to mimic and masquerade as LAD ischemia. Here's a great study that looked at when there was diagnostic uncertainty, and it looked like the 107 patients with PE and just over 250 patients with ACS in the LED as the suspected territory. What you found, if you just look for two things, that if you see S1, Q3, T3, or that right axis deviation, you don't see any ACS. But furthermore, if you see T wave inversions, in those precordial leads plus lead three, this is highly specific for a pulmonary embolism. So let's take this back to our patient who has got the most thrombophilic malignancy with pancreatic cancer awaiting a Whipple, who comes in with sudden onset of hypoxia and shortness of breath. Sure, she has that S1Q3T3. She also has that ABRST elevation. And in this setting with the tachycardia and the T-wave inversion in lead three, you really need to think about hypoxia and pulmonary embolism. Use your POCUS, use your clinical judgment and make the right diagnosis. But the other important association when you put all these findings together is like this patient, 68 pleuritic hypoxic tachycardia. Sure, look at his ECGs. You got the S1Q3T3. But if you're focused on the right side of the screen and you see those deep precordial T wave inversions in V1 to V2 to V4, and you start thinking, geez, I wonder if this is Wellens, the key thing is to look at lead three. And you know I'm a plus one guy and I always talk about patterns because that's the way my brain works. What I like to think about pulmonary embolism in the setting of differentiating from ischemia is Wellens plus one. If you see the T wave inversion in the precordial leads and you're thinking Wellens, look at lead three. If the T wave is flipped there, that's gonna be specific. That's gonna be your pulmonary embolism. That's gonna be your lead point. So go there, think about that. Here's a great ECG. It's uh, early on in my career about 15 years ago. Look at this ECG. I'm not, you're not gonna get fooled this time. I think even wrote the findings. I think I was even writing cursive back then. It was so long again. Consider acute ischemia. Now, look, this person has ST elevations in his lateral leads, but we don't treat ECGs. This guy's 32. He has a cough. He has a cold. He has a fever. This isn't a STEMI. And about 12 hours later, after I had a clean cath, this was his ECG, and he had a focal myocarditis. His story did not fit. We don't treat ECGs, we treat stories. What about this one? December 25th, 2005. You know what's significant about that day? What's significant is it's Christmas. What is also significant is December 25th in hospitals is the time where Jews and Muslims unite to take over the world and unite to have peace and harmony 
and cover people that have stennies. Here's the problem with this stenny. This guy's writhing in pain. Yeah, his ECG looks terrible. He's got an inferior stenny with lateral reciprocal changes. I get it. But he looks terrible. He's screaming. He's colicky. He looks horrible. And this guy is an aortic dissection. And the key is you don't treat ECGs. These are colicky people. These people can't stand still. 24% of them will have a positive trope. So you can't anticoagulate every trope. And it's a clean kill if you do give this guy a lytic or you really will cause him harm. Take a story. I can't stress this enough. Take a story. If you want to think about STEMI-ish and you want to think about STEMIs that aren't true STEMIs, you need to think outside of the box. And when you think about the box, I want to introduce you to my newest favorite acronym, MINOCA. MINOCA is an MI with non-obstructed coronary arteries. So when you exclude all obvious causes of MIs, or at least electrocardiographically, you get left with a subset of things like Takasubos and Prince Metals and Mayo and other things. And the way we define a MINOCA is that these people electrocardiographically have a STEMI, but when you do their cath, they don't have clinically significant disease and there's no overt cause. What you need to know about MINOCA is it happens in young females. It's five times more common in women, and it's certainly seen in a younger cohort of patients that are typ typical of our MIs. This needs to stay on our radar. Let me tell you about a story. This was a humbling story, and in the setting of Minoka, I think this is such an important thing that you need to be aware of. This is a 33-year-old who I saw with one of the PGY2s um, a few years ago. And uh, Richard saw this young woman. She's 33. She's had five babies. Her last one was about 36 hours ago. And when you've had five babies and you're in a public health care system, that means you've been home already for about 18 hours. So she's home just trying to sort out nursing and whatnot. And she gets crushing chest pain. Her blood pressure, 120 over 80. Her heart rate is 90. She is not hypoxic. She has crushing chest pain. And I know this. I've been around the block. I know that when you have chest pain and you're pregnant or just were pregnant, it's probably going to be a pulmonary embolism. I mean, that's kind of what I've been doing for the last while. However, when you take her story, when you look at her, she's got a really good story for ischemia. So, I'm a pretty astute doc. I got an ECG. Kind of step of the game. Shit. You know, I wasn't expecting those tombstones in the precordial lead. I'm telling you, this woman is 33 years old. 33 years old. She has no cardiac risk factors. All she has is five children at home. 36 hours ago, the last. Last one. So this is the third time. And I want you to pick up your glass and I want you on the count of three to screen out or you don't have to scream like the way I'm talking. I want you to tell me what the diagnosis of this young woman. One, two, three. Okay, mixed. But I know the people in the back all got it. She's got SCAD. SCAD is a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. If you try to Google search or Google image SCAD, you keep getting these photos of the Savannah College of Art and Design. It's time for a rebrand here. SCAD is an entity that is a real important part of Minoka in that it's a young female problem. And it's a real important thing and you will see why. And we need to get this out to the foreground because SCAD will screw you up. Just like an aortic dissection, this is an intimal tear in the coronary artery that propagates and causes a false lumen. When you look at people who present with ACS with SCAD, 30% are going to present with a STEMI and 70% are going to present with a non-STEMI. When you look at all patients with angiograms with ACS, 
about one to 4% of those will have SCAD. And in about 32 to 46% of those, you will see the LAD involved. This is like a dissection of the aorta, but it's a more focal point, but behaves very similar. And treatment considerations are somewhat similar. So what you need to know about SCAD is the history is the same as an MI. There is no troponin negative SCAD. These people rip their artery and leak troponin. These people will have chest pain and they will present like an MI, except that they will look phenotypically different. So when you think about SCAD, you really need to know who are the usual suspects who get SCAD. And the first group you have to realize is this is predominantly a woman's health issue. This represents up to 43% of MIs in women under the age of 50. Have you seen SCAD? Then you're not following up on your cath reports. This represents 85 to 94 percent of SCAD occur in women as opposed to men and the mean age is 43 and over 90 percent of the cluster of cases occurs in women and men under the age of 65. This is SCAD. There is the poster. When you look at SCAD, the other cohort, which is about 8 percent of all cases of SCAD, is the postpartum SCAD or the pregnancy associated SCAD that is rare in that it occurs in about two and a hundred thousand pregnancies and it often is postpartum in three quarters of the cases and typically is seen in grand mal tips or people who've suffered from preeclampsia throughout their pregnancy. What we know is these women do worse and pregnancy associated SCAD is more likely to have a higher mortality more likely to have more vessels and larger vessels. And what happens pathophysiologically is that the coronary artery has estrogen and progesterone receptors. And the longer you go in pregnancy and the longer you go in terms of multiparity, these walls weaken and become fragile and eventually tag, uh, tear and obviously will recur with subsequent pregnancy. Pregnancy associated SCAD is a frightening thing. And it goes to speak of respecting hormones. We know that 10 to 13% of the times there will be a hormonal trigger that causes SCAD, whether this is starting OCP, whether this is starting HRT, whether this is a postpartum patient who stops breastfeeding and has a sudden counter regulatory. Uh, surge in her hormones. This is when you might see SCAD and that might be the clue that they start to get angina. And the most frightening thing, and I tried to politically correct this with my wife for the longest time in terms of how to say this, is they get menstrual angina. That drop in progesterone can cause menstrual angina. And you can wonder that a woman who one to two days before her period is starting to have some pain or indigestion or chest pain may trigger that this is just PMS, but this is much worse than PMS. And it's a real concern. And some of these women who have established diagnosis are taking things like calcium channel blockers premenstrually to prevent these occurrences. This is a tough disorder. The other really interesting part pathophysiologically, and this is a new disorder, is that when you look at people with SCAD, 60% of them will have a significant stressor. 20% of the time that stressor will be physical, like doing isometric exercises, like lifting weights, or even completing the Ironman triathlon that you've always wanted to do. But 40% of the time, it will be a significant emotional stressor. You just lost your job. Your partner walked out on you. And when a 30-year-old comes in and says, I had a fight with my, my husband, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my wife, we usually blow these people off because they're 30 and they're emotional. But these are the people who get SCAD. This is not some soft, sucky problem. This stressor contributes in a counter-regulatory hormone way, kind of like tachysubos with a stress catecholamine effect on the coronaries that shears them and tears them. 
have some empathy for your people who have an emotional distress. Their complaint might very well be physical. Yeah, as I'm always a plus one guy, I think you need to think about SCAD and we'll talk about why when you see ACS plus one. And when I'm talking think SCAD, when you see ACS plus a young female with no risk factors presenting with ACS, Think SCAD when you see a postpartum or pregnant woman presenting with ACS. Or also think about SCAD in someone with ACS or chest pain with significant physical or emotional stresses going on. These are three things you have to think about. And thinking about SCAD is important because you need to plant this seed. Because if you have a STEMI, Things are going to be really different if it's caused by SCAD or if it's caused by a plaque rupture and a coronary artery occlusion, not a Minoka. And you need to get on the horn and talk to your cardiologist or interventionist to help you manage. This is not standard ACS protocols. There's a paucity of data on this. But what we know is you can't manage these patients impulsively with aspirin, ticagrelor, or heparin. And if you're not at a, a cath lab like where I work in the ivory tower with thrombolytics, you need to have a real balanced discussion about whether you want to start TPA if you're in the community and you're highly suggestive of SCAD because it is so imperative that you get this person to a cath lab so that they can figure out what the diagnosis is so they can be appropriately treated. Now there are three types of SCAD and the first type which is pathognomonic and occurs in just under 30 percent is when you cat these people it's a pretty clean cath in all these patients. You don't see plaque rupture, you don't see atherosclerosis, but here you will see multiple radiolucent lumens. In type two, which is about 67% of the time, you see diffuse and smooth narrowing of the coronary artery, kind of like an intramural hematoma. And lastly, about 4% of the time, you see focal or tubular stenosis. Now type two and three, specifically type three, are very angiographic dependent in terms of the skill set. And sometimes you need to use intervascular, intercoronary ultrasound, or optical um, uh, tomography to actually look inside the vessel 3D. But if you plant that seed to the cardiologist and say, hey, I really think this is SCAD, have a look at that and make sure that's going to guide your therapy. When you think about SCAD, what we know is if you can, what you always wanna do with SCAD is let them heal spontaneously. When you're squirting that dye and you see that tear, 70 to 90% will heal without a stent. They will do fine. It's people who have ongoing ischemia, hemodynamic instability, or left main disease who will need to have a stent. And these lesions are long. And technically, this is a very challenging thing. If you're working at a center that doesn't have it, up to 50% of the time, you'll have technical failure, and you have a 15 times increased risk of an iatrogenic dissection as a result of your dissection of the artery with your instrument. These are people you don't want to stent if you don't have to. You want it to heal. But we typically will keep these people in hospital for up to a week, which is much longer than our typical regimen, because complications often happen in the first week. About 13% of patients with SCAD who get a PCI will go on to need a cabbage. The problem with cabbage is normally when you get a cabbage, that vessel lasts for about 20 years. Once you get a cabbage for SCAD, you have to realize that that offers you no future protection, that that vessel is just as likely to tear again. It's a really bad disease. When you are shooting dye and when you're an angiographer, the one thing you're shooting at as you're exiting into the renal artery is shooting for this string of bead signs 
of fibromuscular dysplasia, which is not an anti-inflammatory, not an inflammatory, not an atherosclerotic, but a hypertrophy of the renal artery. And people think this is a tremendously high association, up to 86%. And what you need to do is when these people are done and you've looked at the renal arteries, you need to scan them, CT from brain to pelvis, to look for other areas of dissections and aneurysms because we often find stuff in the brain. We've talked about hormones, we've talked about pregnancy, and the same sort of connective tissue disorders like Marfan's, um, Louis Dietz syndrome, um, all these syndromes that make you nervous from a connective tissue disorders, these are the same thing that also play a role in coronary artery dissection. The other really curious thing is 40% of patients who get migraines seem to be, of, sorry, of patients who get SCAD, 40% of them will be migraine sufferers, which is much higher than the general pop. So you need to screen for other conditions. You need to realize that this is a tough disorder. 20 to 29% will recur. Mean recurrence is 2.8 years. And what's really difficult is even when these people are in hospital, there's a pain that someone gets who's torn an artery that isn't necessarily the sort of anginal pain. It's just the pain of suffering a torn artery, like you may have seen in patients with vertebral artery tears. It just hurts and it's hard to tell, but it's a really tough, tough existence because this is going to recur and it's a challenging diagnosis. It's a challenging form of Minoka. So what can I tell you on my first Zoom webinar for EMU? Get over that women are atypical. I hope that we're done with this. Men and women are both typical. The doctors are atypical in how they had an inability to appropriately diagnose women. You need to take histories. You need to ask patients, how does it feel? If it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. But with STEMI-ish, you have to go with your spider senses and see who really has your STEMI. If you're simple like me, you have to look for patterns. If you're thinking about a PE and somehow your brain is shifted to Wellens and the T-wave inversion V1 through V4, look for the Wellens plus one and sneak your eyes to the left side of the screen and look for that T-wave inversion in lead three. If you see a patient with ACS and it's a young woman who phenotypically looks normal, if it's a woman who's postpartum or pregnant or if it's someone who's at a significant stressor, think about SCAD because thinking about SCAD is a game changer because you will not treat them impulsively with TPA or TNK or antiplatelet agents that might do them harm, but you'll have a discussion of the risks and benefits with your cath lab operator. And lastly, apart from EMU, there's only one place I'd rather be. I hope to see you guys next year. I can't wait to share the screen in person. Cheers, and I'm happy to take all your questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, David. That was great. Uh, we have a number of questions. We have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Just before we get to the questions, uh, I understand that Captain Canada, Hall of Fame NBA Canadian star, Steve Nash, interviewed you. Uh, that's kind of cool. Tell me about it. Yeah, you know what? It was actually super cool. And it happened right in this room, right, right in this room. Um, you know what? I kind of felt that the messaging and the signaling was getting blunted and was um, needed to be bipartisan. And, and I felt that I would reach out on Twitter to people who I thought were important and Canadian and could speak to our values. And what was awesome was I tweeted this and uh, Steve Nash's people wrote me back within a day and four days later, um, he was such a gracious guy and super articulate and smart and uh, super curious and uh, a real pleasure, a real career highlight. I would say next to talking to you today, that was essentially my second biggest podcast in my life. 
Okay, very cool, very cool. Um, okay, so I'm gonna start with some questions. Um, this one is not related to SCAD and then there's a whole bunch of questions related to SCAD. So for the young man with new focal ST elevation MI-like changes who also has a URTI symptoms, would you still activate the cath lab? Well, I think it depends where you work. Uh, I think that, are, are we excluding COVID? Because COVID kind of screwed this talk up completely. And clearly there's some arterial narrowing COVID that may be different. Look, I work in a center, which is a little different than yours in that I do have a cath lab and it's a lot easier because I'm not shipping. Um, but I think it's a discussion. I think that you should call cath, you may call code blue, but have a talk to say, listen, this is a 30 year old who doesn't use coke, who's not marfanoid, who's got a nothing story and sounds very infectious, be it COVID or myo. Tell me how you wanna play this. Let's manage this together and have shared decision making because it's not a slam dunk. And if you're working at a center where you don't have to call cardiology, you just put them in an ambulance with their aspirin and ticagrelor and heparin and ship them to the cath lab direct, this might be one of those times where you actually don't do that and you actually phone a friend and ask for help. Okay, so uh, a bunch of questions related to SCAD. Let's start out first with what percentage of patients with SCAD will have elevated uh, cardiac biomarkers? You don't see trope negative SCAD. So really, if you keep these people up to 100% will be, there is no diagnostic quandary. And when we talk about it, I always say there's a story, there's an ECG or trope, and the simplest one to interrogate and to interpret is a troponin. You will have a positive troponin. Now, it may take a few hours to rise, but you're not going to see trope negative SCAD. So use that to rest assured this is not SCAD in someone who has never if not had tropes. Now, if someone's having ongoing menstrual angina, one might want to think about this in terms of the hormonal changes. But if you have ACS, if you have ECG changes, if you have a good story, you should see trope spill if you tear. Okay. Uh, so a number of questions related to use of antiplatelet agents, anticoagulant. Um, are antiplatelet and anticoagulants contraindicated with SCAD, right? So, you know, in other dissections, cervical artery dissections are often treating it with antithrombotics. Um, how, do, how, do we, how do we use this? Uh, are, we, are we getting stuck by using these anticoagulants early on with an so, Excellent question. I, I think that this was ob the obvious question that I've had. And the real hard part is I've talked to experts of SCAD across the world, be it in, in Minnesota and British Columbia, where some of the world leaders are. There's no real clear cut guidance. I think the key is that if someone gets a stent and gets, has SCAD and they get stented, they're going to be put on dual antiplatelet therapy. So at bare minimum, everyone can have aspirin. Um, apart from that, the Plavix, Ticagrelor, heparin decisions, they're kind of up to who you're speaking to and how long it's going to be to the cat lab. It might be a case where you'd rather drip some heparin as opposed to bolus because then you can turn it off uh, on the table. But essentially, I think the key is where a lot of my emu people that I love to, inter, uh, to interact with, they're working in places where they don't have a cath lab, and you're going to have to make a tough call, which is to lice or not to lice. And I think that's the bigger decision is, and I think you, if you have a strong sense that this is SCAD, like if you see a 33-year-old postpartum patient with no risk factors, and you're pretest is really high, you may not lice, especially if you're a couple hours away from a center, but you may start on a heparin infusion and some aspirin, plus or minus Plavix, but that is not going to be the call of the emergency physician. The call of the emergency physician is to escalate this and saying, I'm really worried about SCAD. I've given some aspirin. Can you, I want to get this person out because I know the diagnosis and management will be governed by what you find in the cath lab. Tell me how you want to run it because six doctors are going to tell you six different things. So, uh, you know, we obviously haven't been hearing a lot about SCAD in our continuing education. And maybe I have seen patients with SCAD and I've sent them home. If SCAD heals on their own, um, does that mean that if we're missing the diagnosis, they're generally doing well and having good outcomes? Probably, probably. I mean, if you, if you, if you trope them, you might see it. Um, I, I think what, look, I, I've given you guys a talk on dissection screwing you up and endocarditis screwing you up. And this is my third in the trilogy of cardiac stuff that can screw you up. And it's crazy to think this is the most common cause of an MI in women of our cohort. 
And we're not talking about this. This is a relatively new thing. Look, this spontaneously heals up to 90%, but awareness is important and making that diagnosis important. I think it's possible. It's not got the fatality like an aortic dissection where you have a one to 2% mortality per hour. So within two days, you've killed 50% of your patients if you miss this diagnosis. Majority are gonna heal, but this is gonna change their life down the road and they're gonna be put on beta blockers to reduce their shearing force. They're gonna be followed closely. They're gonna do things and avoid things that could potentiate that tearing. So are there any other clues on ECG besides that ST elevation, any other prodromal signs that we might see on the electrocardiogram before they go on to completely dissect? No, remember that 3070 in terms of STEMI and non-STEMI, um, it's not an electrocardiographic. It's not a biomarker. Those are both going to be given to you. It's going to be your story. It's going to be you thinking ACS plus one. It's going to be that young woman who's younger than us who looks super healthy and is having an MI. It's going to be that postpartum patient or it's going to be someone with an emotional trigger. Those three things are going to be paramount to you making this diagnosis. Your EKG and troponin will be gravy to say something's up, but to put them in that cause of Minoka, like a Prince Metals or, or a Takasubo, where you have an MI, but your coronaries are not obstructive, that's the skill of the master clinician. And that's what we have to do. And so again, you mentioned, you know, the challenges around those who may still be using thrombolytics if you're far from a, from a PCI site. Is there increased risk from the thrombolytic above the usual risk from the thrombolytic because of the dissection? Yeah, I mean, again, these are not studied, but ph physiologically, we've always been taught that aortic dissections, we really don't want to thrombolyze them. And I think the same thoughts go towards uh, coronary uh, artery dissections as well. Um, we don't have literature to support it, but certainly that practice is not preferred. Now, sometimes you have to make judgment calls. And if you're eight hours from a cath lab and you have someone with ongoing ischemia and they're 50 years old and they're having an MI, then you may think it could be scabbed, but the risk benefit will be that a cardiologist says, look, you're eight hours away and it probably could very well be just an occluded coronary artery, you better thrombolyze this person. So I think it's shared decision making, but you want to avoid it. If you can get them to a cath lab, let that be the god of your therapy. Don't do the drip and ship. Do the ship and then drip. Okay. If uh, that makes any sense. I think, uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I think that... Um, that might be it for, uh, for the questions. Uh, before I forget, I just actually want to let everybody know that the, uh, the recordings of this webinar will be made available soon on our Emergency Medicine Update uh, website, emupdate.ca. And I think that um, that's pretty much all the questions. This has actually been a lot of fun, David. I really appreciate uh, you taking the time out. I know it's been actually a busy time for all of us and we've been focused on our clinical work and you kind of stepping up and, and pulling this together on short notice. It's really appreciated. This has been uh, a great experience and uh, thank you very much. Oh, the pleasure was absolutely mine and I'm looking forward to next year hanging out in person, Rick, and please stay well. For sure. Uh, I want to thank all of our participants for, uh, for joining us, and I look forward to seeing all of you next week. Uh, thanks again from Emergency Medicine Update. Take care.